This week we are hopping from one classic Bible story, Jonah and the Whale, to another that has captured the imagination of young children for years, Daniel in the Lion's Den. But much like last week, where we shifted our focus from the center of the Jonah narrative to the end of his story, which revealed further lessons for us, I'd like to do something similar with Daniel this week. The lions, you see, come at the very end of Daniel's story. And while they might be the most spectacular in gaining attention as a central moment in Daniel's life, they are truly but one instance of his character revealed. Daniel's story actually begins many years before the lions. When he is a young man, perhaps not much older than a boy, he lives through the siege of Jerusalem by the Babylonians. And as the Babylonians enter into the city as conquerors, they are under orders to take the best and the brightest of the young men of Jerusalem and ship them back to the king's court in uh, Babylon to be trained in service to the king. Now, Daniel was among those young men, as were his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, whom you may know as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Under King Nebuchadnezzar, these four young men first advocate for themselves. They do so uh, so that they can are allowed to eat and drink only those foods which are allowed them by Jewish law, instead of eating from the exotic bounty of the king's table. They're challenged on this, but finally the king relents to their request, and soon they surpass all of the other young men who are partaking of those more rich and exotic foods. That's the first scene of Daniel's life. Next, we discover that Daniel, like Joseph in Egypt, is prophetic in his ability to interpret dreams, and he has an opportunity to do so for the king despite potential peril because it turns out that the king's dream is not necessarily a flattering one. At this point, the narrative takes a quick detour, mentioning just Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in their trip into the furnace, but then we quickly return to Daniel fully a man now and working within the palace courts, still having his reputation for dream interpretation for he has now done so for uh, King Nebuchadnezzar several times. Now Belshazzar, Nebuchadnezzar's son, is now on the throne ruling unwisely and it is Daniel who interprets a vision that heralds the sudden end to his reign and the overthrow of Belshazzar's kingdom by the Persians and Medes. Enter King Darius the Mede and the beginning of our story today. Now there was a reason I wanted to push way back before our text today and explore Daniel's story from the beginning. First of all, because oftentimes when we imagine Daniel, I think most of us imagine this middle-aged man Something like this. The reality is that if we assume an age of 15 when young Daniel was taken into exile, then he would have been a minimum of 73 at the time of our text and perhaps as old as 90. It all depends on how you sync the references to the overthrow of Belshazzar and the reign of Darius with the actual attestations to those persons and events in extra biblical material. Regardless, he would have been well into the latter years of his life. And this run in with the satraps is just the latest in what has been a long string of events and situations in Daniel's life that have tested his resolve to live faithfully before God over 60 years worth. Another thing to recognize is that over those 60 odd years of living in a strange land that eventually I'm sure he learned to consider home, that over those 60 years, Daniel lived under and served in the courts of five kings representing two different empires. And if you add in his early childhood, you actually have him living amongst three different countries and kingdoms. And that's where I'm finding both the instruction and the hope in this text for today. First, the instruction. 
The whole of the story of Daniel in the lion's den revolves around his practice of prayer. Three times a day, he faces Jerusalem and bows down before God. This is not done in secret or hidden from others, for obviously the satraps were well aware of his regular practice in their attempts to use it against him. And obviously, it is so regular, regular enough that they know exactly when to catch him in the act and ensure his conviction under the law. Again, however, this is not the first time that we see Daniel participating in and standing up for the particular practices of his faith. From what he eats, to his modes of worship, to his commitment to a life as a prophet, to his prayer life, Daniel has consistently upheld the practices of his faith across his lifespan. In this, he remains the constant plumb line as the intrigues of the court and its power and corruption and change swirl around him. And so in Daniel's example, perhaps we can find instruction for these unsteady times in which we find ourselves. As the shadow of COVID deepens and the numbers climb this fall, our lives are shifting yet again to halt the spread. The amount of strain that this disease has put on our lives, our mental health, our institutions, our economy can hardly be overstated. It is now becoming clear that many family and cultural traditions will be upended this winter. When you add to this political uncertainties, the critiques being leveled against many of our systems and institutions, and this the specter of climate disruption, it can be difficult to find one's emotional footing. Daniel reminds us that the practices of our faith, regular times of prayer and meditation, the reading of scripture, worship and song, the connection of caring fellowship and a generosity of in our spirit, attending to these practices not letting the challenges of the time sway you from them, helps us to weather the storms and chart a steady course into a better future. During this time, as we move back to online expressions of church, and many of the practices of our faith move from the church building and into our own homes, I encourage you to avail yourself of the resources that are out there that we're trying to provide to help you engage with God and with each other right where you're at, strengthening you for this season and the next. And then the hope. For me, the miracle is not that God shows up in the lion's den with Daniel for a moment. It is that God has shown up for him again and again and again in his life. The lion's den is just the latest example. The hope that we have in God is that our God is a persistent God who is present with us no matter where we may find ourselves, no matter what the circumstance. We may face difficulty, but we will not be abandoned, is God's promise. We will not be alone. I cannot tell you what the future will hold. Heck, right now I'm having difficulty planning more than a couple weeks out in in advance. I don't know if we're heading into a lion's den this winter, though some days it feels like it. What I do know is that no matter what the future holds, God will be with us in it. And for that, indeed, we can say, thanks be to God. Amen.